library here trying to bring some history, things that people who often overlook to our programs. And one thing I always found so interesting is I've been here 60 years. I read about Sims Floor in the papers when it was a big odor problem, but also when it was doing such amazing things, this selling perfumes, fragrances, and pioneering in that all over the world. And two blocks off of Broadway in this residential area, it, it was just unbelievable. So now that I'm retired, I got signed, I just started to get more interested. And I knew some people that were involved or that families were involved. So we originally were supposed to have this in September. And then we could have had a little walking tour towards the plan, but that didn't work out, so we're here now. And there are some people I spoke to that worked there, and everyone that they couldn't make it because of the weather today. Um, Bobby McGee and um, Al Washington, who worked there, he's a little under the weather. But this weather, everyone's under the weather, but we'll do it. So I'm going to do this PowerPoint, which I've done, and then I got stuff to hand out. Then we have people that work there, and we'll have a round table discussion. So, and, and some of the stuff I have, I also have. This was a booklet that came out in about 59. This is just the, uh, that's priceless. It's like 60 pages of priceless. It's such a beautiful picture that I just wanted to show, I'll just show some of the things from the information we have and just to get a taste of it, a taste of it. And uh, then we'll go further. So that's the cover of this book that came out in 59, and it's a, oh, you'll see. Okay, this is kind of the beginning of it. It's the first couple of pages. List of the products of Sims Floor, and many people. Is it clear for the people here? Yeah. Okay. Because many people don't know it was just fragrances and this, but it was colorings, it was um, stenches even at one time for bad smells, and, and other kind of products. So that's kind of, also it's interesting, of 59, um, what does it say? It says 1899. Oh, oh, so, 19, so I'm wrong, sorry. So 1949, right. So it started actually in 1889, in Manhattan, by Mr. Azakovich. Azakovich. Von Azakovich. And he was a 20 year old Austrian from a good family who studied chemistry. He studied chemistry in Europe, and at 20, he came to Manhattan. And Manhattan was kind of a center of a lot of laboratories. And he looked at that well. He went up to Harlem because it was pretty busy downtown. Harlem was very rural and not even suburban, but rural. He went up there, had his lab. And then in 1903 or 4, it's not clear, he came up from out the cell. Now, you know, it said because of frail health, but it never said he had anything like TB or anything. So, some of the information does. Oh, then it did say TB? Oh, okay. I didn't see. Good. So, it just said he frail health, so he came up here. And then how he hooked up with Louis DeFoyer Sr., who was an immigrant from Spain, who came to America, and they hooked up in Monticello, and they grew it into one of the nationally known um, companies in fragrances and uh, flavorings. Now, Ivakovitz was the the proprietor, he was called the proprietor. So the proprietor, the founder of proprietor, he was a, he was a scientist, a chemist extraordinaire. He lectured at Columbia. Some of us have all his credits and was known to be uh, a, a good boss, a good employer, but the frail health kind of, he died in the 19 teens. But around that time, Louis de Hoyo Sr., married the proprietor's daughter. So that's uh, the continuity, which I didn't know really about that until delving into it. Uh, and then Louis Sr. took over 
with the widow, with the proprietor's widow, who lived till 1960. So she was, and she kind of kept the reins of the, um, the business aspect of Sin Floor. And then, um, so she lived till 1960, and then um, Jehoiah Senior died, and Junior took over, and many of the people there, the principal certainly, did not have long lives. The, the, the ones that were um, in, actually involved with the, with the science processes. So I don't know if there's a, a relationship there. So that's kind of the history, but John said you have, that he did have TV. Oh, okay, interesting. The proprietor. So that's from the second page of this book, where it tells you a little about it. And um, so, so this was actually right, 1889 to 1948. This is a little about the essence of the company and the start and some of their values. This is another thing, a personal message, and that's from Louis de Hoyos. And, uh, you know, this was really to many of the customers who were all over the world trying to show the values that they, even though he was, it was generations later, it was almost 100 or over 50 years later, wanted to show or to express how important their integrity was and their care for the industry and their clients. Do you want me to read that? No, okay. I'm going to pass it around to. Now, this is a bad copy from a 1959 Monticello Bulletin Sentinel. There were three newspapers in Monticello at that time. So, you know, the top picture isn't related and the, uh, the words you can't read, but I just wanted to show that headline, A Simplest Laboratories, the Center of World Traffic in Exotic Plants and Spices. So, you know, there might have been a little local puffery, but I'm sure it was everything I've a world leader, even though it was manned usually between 20 and 30 people, maybe a little more. So this is uh, just a, to see really what machinery, you know, most of us most of us don't have experience with what's going on inside a, a chemical factory, so that's kind of what was there. Now, Bob, could you read the... Um, Looking like some giant Rube Goldberg invention, uh, giant percolators, condensers, and miles of pipe and tubing cooked and separated. I can't make out the first word. From something from the raw products that go into perfumes and flavorings at Sinfor Laboratories. Such flavors as cherry, pineapple, lemon, even coffee are formulated here. Okay, so that's. There's other pictures. This, this picture is in the back building where the gymnastics are Oh, now in the tweed. Okay, so you can try to put it together. Now, what was that? Part? So that was in addition. That's the, yeah, that section was run by uh, Dr. Sidney Austin. By Austin. Okay. So let me just go. Now, so I went, since we can't take a walk into the uh, environment, I took a walk there, and this was shocking. I'd never been inside. What are you seeing right at the front? Oh, yeah. Still, since war? I mean, that's out, and it's an active building. Yeah. What was that made out of? That, that the, look at the printing. It's like I was just shocked. And I went inside, and there was a fellow from the United Way there. He showed me around, and we, we talked a bit. He was busy, but I think the beginning of when you first come in, some of those the offices are similar, and that hasn't been we have. There's some people that know there's some similarity. Um, some things haven't changed at the beginning, but pretty much the rest of it has. And there was uh, a photo by the Mexican muralist, not a photo, a painting. The, the yeah, that he had. That's not there now. <laughs> So, but he was, that was Louis uh, Jr., quite a man about town. So that's that. Now, it's a, this is a picture of the building that was since floors. Now it's United Way and other nonprofits 
Uh, and it is in still a residential neighborhood. Oh, and here's some of the, I just got one of the original product, and this is from 1912. That was like their big product was vanilla. So, so it would be nice if some people here that have bottles of the product with the labels, but we weren't able to get there, maybe we have a follow-up, you know, we'll see the actual bottle. But people said that they gave it a holiday time, he gave a lot of little, you know, items away to, to workers as well as people in the community. So vanilla was big. Now this is this other book, that booklet that came out, Fragrances. Now this was from 1889 to 1964, the 75th anniversary catalog. And this is just copies, but you know, it's not, it's not a lot of the artwork and even on the original is really beautiful or very interesting. And I'll just go into a little, that's just some of the, you know, what to expect from, what you can expect from Simple Book. Because remember, this isn't for the public. Their product sold, I don't know how things have ever really sold to the public. It was a wholesale company. They sold essences of to companies that were making perfumes and um, fragrances and food companies. Uh, so they were just selling very purified, concentrated uh, chemicals or synthetic chemicals. So the name Synthlor is, you know, synthetic flowers. So, you know, his thing was, he was a real guy, but the stuff was synthetic. Um, there's just some price list to show the variety <coughs> of things that he sold. You can't, bath colognes, you have to shave. And he didn't sell the product, just the, the, the fragrances that made them palatable and saleable. Antiperspirants, bubble baths, cold wave lotions, creams, everything. It was such a different market, such a world. And just in that little place, these are the okay. Let's go to the end. It's the, the specialties, and that's some of the product. And there you can see it's giving it's giving the prices too, and that's probably about dollars from fifty nine. So this just shows some of the places where they had, they had representatives, you know, all, all of them were from New Zealand to two in India, different cities in India, not in China, but Europe certainly big in South and Central America and Mexico. Now this is, this is a flyer of an advertisement in the trade journal from 1951, one of the big, what they were known for, Wave Mask 30. Now what is that? It's a perfect way to, you know, I don't know that much about permanent waves, but I know they stink. So they, so one of their fragrances was selling to the manufacturers of permanent waves to give a better um, scent to it. So that was, that was one of the, in, in this journal of the uh, manufacturer, the um, Chemical and Perfume Manufacturers Association, that the proprietor was involved with at its formation in the early 1900s. This was another flyer from that, not talking about any specific product, but just also accentuating Synthlor's capabilities and sincerity and uh, what they do. And on the bottom it shows some of the places where they, some places they have actual offices, other places they have manufacturing representatives. So I think that's it on that aspect. So now we're gonna have 
Um, but I think we just have a little more to talk about. Oh, so here we have patents. They had patent on a sinful, or a, a trademark patent. What was it? A trademark. But it said, okay. From the United States Patent Office, they trademarked synth lore, you know, that, that topography and that character. So this is their whole application, and then it finally it did lapse on you. It was taken over as a fact, as the company was by Nestle's. And then after that, it became part of Bell Fragrance. And I called Belfry, they're in the middle, they're out of Chicago, but they're out of Middletown. I called them about three weeks ago, and the woman in personnel, human, human resources, she said their last simple person retired somewhere in the last year. She wouldn't give me the name, but I, I emailed her you know, contact information. I don't think anyone here is from that person. So the last floor isn't at, at Bell anymore. Um, but this is the, the patent trade from the patent office the trademark. Just give me one minute here and then we'll now this this is all about the cell by Edward Curley. This came out in the 30s. It was a reply. He wrote for the local newspaper, the column. And he does have some information, a couple of pages about, that's the only book that I saw about, um, there's a lot of stuff in Old Mother, there's about three or four pages about the formation of the, and, and uh, the proprietor coming up here. Um, and some of it is a quote from Louis, um, and you know, so this, and we saw this picture, but this was the Central Labs, we saw this from the weekly newspaper, and it just shows other things going on, not just that that we saw. And here's two people, experimental lab, Francis Valanova and her husband, they both worked there. And those they were chemists in the, in the plant there. So that just shows some of the work. And, and people mentioned price, they have Tom Price of Monticello compounds several aromatic oils according to a formula in the production laboratory. So, um, now, it, it's interesting in reading some old articles, a lab like this, since they weren't selling retail, just wholesale, all the money was coming in from everywhere else. And since most of the people weren't there, so it was really uh, good for the economy, as opposed to a restaurant, well, the local people spend the money and then it's going back. But here it's not circular, it's all that money is coming in and it's pretty much staying in Monticello. So that, that's an interesting thing. So I think uh, we'll have a round table, people that want to sit, people that work there or families work there to uh, sit around here and we'll talk. If you want or if you don't want to come up front, you can go front. But if we, Oh, I, I, I can start out if you want. Okay. So, okay. so you sit up there. I have, some, yeah, I, have some, I have some of the information, and some of it, I can thank Janet Martin Wright, who's here, who worked for Sidport for a number of years, and she had uh, forwarded me some of the information. And a lot of it goes back to the original history. Uh, as Myron said, when Mr. Valensakovich came here, uh, from Austria. He attended a university in Austria uh, with fragrances and uh, didn't like the future there. It was similar to what's in Switzerland today where every person uh, who's able to is in the military and stays, you know, basically a lot of them stay in one way, shape, or form. And that's one reason he left. And uh, uh, as I would say, he was a very frail individual. And when the time came to, to Monticello. And I have quite a bit of information on his family, his daughters, and, and one uh, daughter that got married came from real aristocracy in Virginia, uh, right up through the whole uh, 
people want to look at it later, you can tell you that one of the relatives was even goes back to Pocahontas that was married, you know, somebody of nobility in Virginia and, you know, came up to the, you know, family here. Mr. Van Isaacovich also, when he came to Monticello, bought a large piece of land that's two blocks from here, around the perfume factory, and he called it Valcuse Park. And if you go back in some the history of the area, you'll see Valcuse Park mentioned. There's several blocks uh, in that area, and Sid Floor and the family owned several of the houses around there, and a lot of the employees uh, lived in these houses. And uh, you know, obviously it helped uh, you know, keep, keeping help in the, in the area. Uh, I first started coming up here in the late 40s. Uh, my father was a chemist and came up here and worked on weekends. And uh, then after coming up here weekends, off and on for several years, you know, he, he moved up here and he was the, the chief chemist for a perfume factory. But during the first years there, one of the secrets, and now it's pretty public, that, that one of the main fragrances that really set this company off in the 30s and 40s was they made the scent for Johnson's baby powder, which everybody knows and still, Bell is still using the same formula and, uh, you know, patented formula for, uh, to sell to, to Johnson & Johnson. They also made a lot of flavorings. Besides the essences, they were into flavorings real big. And when I came here, there was a gentleman named Jack Bouton who did was a flavoring chemist. My father was a scent chemist. He was a flavoring chemist. And one of the big products that they had years ago was the flavoring for Needix orange drink, which most people don't know unless you knew, you know, what was going on in Manhattan in the 40s, like you have a McDonald's on every corner today. In those days, you had a Needix orange drink on every corner in, uh, in Manhattan. Uh, this was followed by a company CNC Bottling Company, I think it was in Englewood, New Jersey, produced the first soda in cans. This was, I think, somewhere around the early 50s. And Sinfor made the flavors for these sodas in cans. We had steel cans, and before that, all sodas that you bought, there was no plastic, obviously, was all in bottles. Mm -hmm. And they, they came out with the phrase, a steel can, and it had a top on it like a Coke can. And you needed a church key to take, you know, the top off. But this was the first soda in cans. Uh, you know, this goes on and on. The connection between, uh, as Myron said, uh, the Luis de Hoya Sr. from Spain also set up a factory in Mexico and did quite a bit of perfuming fragrances for a company, their logo, I just remember the logo, looked something like the Polo logo of today. And they also made flavorings, quite a bit of flavorings, uh, which they did for uh, three different soda companies in, in Mexico. Pascual Lulu in uh, Mexico, Pascual was Donald Duck was a young one, and Lulu was Little Lulu, the two cartoon characters, and Mexico was just a you know, take off on any other cola that, uh, that they used in Mexico. They also employed a, a gentleman named Juan Lucini. I don't know if you ever met him, who did, who was a West Point graduate, extremely intelligent Spanish person, was a West, was a West Point graduate, but was basically almost blind. And when he did a lot of the translations for Sinflor, I, I remember watching him as a little kid in the office, and he'd be like this with a magnifying glass just to read what he had to read and you know translate it and then from English to Spanish, Spanish to English back and forth. And he was he lived right next door to his little house, he looked at the front of Sin Floor's little house right next door. Uh, he he lived there, he and his and his wife. But he was one of the types of individuals that, that Sin Floor employed that was you know bilingual and could really, you know, extremely intelligent person and had a vocabulary in Spanish bigger than most of us have in English. I mean, this is, uh, this is you know, something else that I, I learned over the years. And uh, I, I, like I said, I, I can bring you up into the 1960s. J. 
Johnny could probably bring you a lot further. <laughs> you know that. When did your but, father work there, Joe? Uh, well, about part time, the late forties till he, <coughs> he died in the fifty nine. So that you know, through that whole area, I could you know, I can tell you quite a bit. I can remember you know, Judy can going to get off and talk, but her parents worked there, and her father worked there for. 30, 40 years, and they, like the, uh, some of the PowerPoints pointed out that they mixed a lot of fragrances, and they developed a lot of fragrances, and Mr. Van Osakovich is what really brought him into being, into being uh, a person who really developed so many fragrances, is that he believed that it could be done synthetically. You know, years ago, we, we heard about crushing rose petals to get the fragrances for perfumes. Well, he developed a lot of the fragrances that were developed that made, uh, you know, made Sinflor kind of take off, you know. And uh, he was, if you read his whole history, you can, you know, really get into what, what he was nationally, internationally, and, and what Louis De Hoyas Sr., who died, I believe, in 51, uh, was on an international, he was known internationally in, in, in the business. Uh, and I know they even had some French connections, because I remember going with my father up to Cook's Falls, which is right above Roscoe, and meeting a famous uh, chemist from France, and how they talked. There was also something else in, in when they, developed a lot of these fragrances is that they would try to copy a lot of the fragrances. One that they did so well when it was Chanel number no. five when it was big and they used to tell everybody Chanel number no. five when they gave out the Christmas presents, but it was you know, it was a, their own knockoff on it. It was basically what it was, but it was an excellent, you know, fragrance. Uh, the flavorings, I, I don't know today what flavorings you know are, are involved, but I know that in the days of, of flavorings, they uh, they complemented cases of strawberries for a strawberry soda. You know they mixed mixed in with whatever they could, and uh, you know the family finally sold out. Uh, Sid Floor Lewis the Hoyas Jr. did. Uh, but yeah, you know, he only had a daughter, one child, and that was it. They also had other members of the family who lived in the area. Uh, Louis the Hoyas Sr.'s mother lived across the street. Her sister lived down by what we used to call Mayor's Pond across the street down off of Lakewood Avenue. Uh, another sister, Rosa O'Carroll, whose husband was a foot sprayer and then the, the postmaster in Monticello. And you know, they had a whole family here. and. Uh, you know, worked quite a bit, and I was talking before everybody came in. I, was, I remember uh, Judy's father mixing uh, a lot of batches of, of in 55 gallon drums when they sold big drums full of different essences in that. He would, would have a funnel that was about this big around, and he would have filters in it. And they filtered sometimes several times. They had to filter everything that was put into the drum to make sure that it was so pure. That you know, which was I guess more of a quality issue than it was anything else. Did you want to add to that, Judy? Because you're, you know, you were. Um, well, I never went. I never went to the to the labs that often. I guess as much as Jerry did. But what I remember about it was that um, my father always smelled terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Could you say your name and your dad's name so we have a record? Okay. Please. My name is Judy Morse Wolkoff. My father was Levi Morse. Um, he worked at St. Fleur for 43 years. My mother originally worked there and um, before they were married. And then uh, she met my father. My father went into World War II and she worked while he was away. When he came back, she got him the job at Sinclair. And he was there for 43 years. Uh, he was, he had no formal education, only high school. He was 
was an assistant chemist. And by the time he got done, he could have been a chemist like that's that's Jerry's good. father. How many people worked there? Yes, in the, in the 20s, yeah. basically, when we were growing yeah. up. And, and were most of them chemists? Or what, what, what? No, but in everything, you know, I mean, uh, from shipping, I mean, you had, yeah. you had uh, Sidney Austin, who was married to one of the uh, member of the family, who, mm -hmm. who I mentioned that picture that was here with all the pipes and, mm -hmm. you know, tanks and everything. And Sidney, so the chief chemist was also married to some of the family? Yes. Oh, and, uh, thank you. And he was, uh, you know, he mixed everything and cooked it. I read, you know, I, mean, I don't know how else to explain it, but he was, he cooked everything back there. That, that's where a lot of the smell that people complained about that wiped it through the whole village of Monticello. And, uh, and you know, everybody who went to school concerned there was only less than a block away you could smell it. If you went to school in Monticello, you knew about the perfume factory. And uh, that was basically where he was. And uh, uh, Judy's father would, would, would be mixing and filtering and, you know, and, and every, trying to get everything, you know, so they could get it into drums and, and ship it out and uh, on time. In fact, we have a, uh, a flyer here that, that uh, Judy pointed out some things that Janet's name is on it, you know, a rush order to get something, you know, out to a customer. And uh, one thing I remember about it was that um, my father, like I said, was not in a chemist. A chemist, he assisted, and he could smell anything and tell you exactly what was in it. He knew exactly what was in it. When he came home at night and ate his dinner, he would smell his food before he ate it. <laughs> and then I remember as a kid, I couldn't drink Coca-Cola because he would smell the Coca-Cola and he would tell me that's not good for you. So I just had this sense of what was in everything. Would that be because he worked there or did he have that before he went in there? No, that was because he worked there. He just was so used to smelling things and he could, there would be formulas in print but he could tell you what it was without, without reading. Did they have people in there or, sorry, who were like professional smellers or something? How did no, they, 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 no, no, they, no, 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 Going around town, oh. he used to work there. He called a sniffer. Oh, so the people that worked there were just cool. Yeah, I never heard that. Oh. Yeah, I never heard that either from my father. <laughs> but if your father was able to do that, he also had the ability. Because not everybody's nose was able Probably, to do that. Yeah. He was yeah. lucky that he yeah. really had the ability. Yeah. And then uh, my father was five years older than my mother, and he retired first. And then my mother went back to work there, and she eventually retired from Nestle's. So she worked there. Well, what, what did she do? With it? She was bookkeeping. Was Nestle's part of uh, Sinfor? Yeah. Well, they bought Nestle. They bought Sinfor out. They purchased Sinfor. Yeah. And what then, year was that? Nineteen Because I remember riding my bike with um, my daughter, who was like ten, maybe, and we. Road down Bedford Avenue, right? That's out of the corner of where, right? Isn't that Bedford Avenue? Right, yeah. right Bedford, yeah. St. John's. And there was a woman there with a petition. Mm -hmm. And she would say to us, you know, I stopped because I wasn't sure what she was doing. And she said, Isn't this smell awful? And of course, I have not been able to smell since I've been about 20 or 25. So <clears throat> I said, I really can't help you because I can't smell it. But I know that when we left there, Jill said to me, what did she want? And I said, oh, she's just not happy with how it smells. Um, but that was it. But I think that has to be in 19, maybe 82, 83, somewhere in there, because that would have been about the, when Jill was about 9 or 10. 
Could people that work there, you work there, you work there? Could you come up here so we... Oh, I didn't work here. No, you didn't work here. I will yeah. say there was some yeah. um, dissatisfaction yeah. Yeah. in the neighborhood when they built this spray dry building. And that's that massive block building that now is the, was the gymnastics school. And the main opponent to that, as I remember, was um, Clarence Greenwald's wife because she had this beautiful house. That building really did not belong there. And then she would always complain about the people parking on the street. So that was quite a thing. Also, um, the Spray Dry building, uh, 1975 is when I started work there. I worked with your mother. You did? Yes, I did. I certainly did. And I worked there for 37 years. So, so when, can you just forgive the name? And oh, my name yeah. is Janet Barbright. So when Nestle purchased us, uh, that was quite a big to-do. I was hired that year. They brought people in from um, PFW in Middletown. They basically kind of raided a lot of the chemists, the salesmen, and everybody came in. So one of the things that Nestle makes is iced tea. So what they did in the spray dry building was they would make lemon. You would take liquids. You say spray dry building. Spray dry. That's you take liquids. I, okay, you turn that's them, the same. Spray dry. Spray dry. <laughs> spray dry. You take liquids and you turn them into a consistency such as Jello or instant iced tea. So the lemon flavoring for Nestle iced tea was made there, as was lemon flavor for some of their cake mixes, and on and on. But um, the thing that I remember the most was pretty much the physical layout of the building. They had massive roll-top desks, and I mean huge roll-top desks. Some of the people that worked there, some of the old-timers were um, Violet Furman, her father worked there, Dottie Heinley, Harriet Osborne and her husband Lou, and um, the balance Wales, he was the head chemist at the time. And then things got progressively more technical and with regulations and such, you know, it was transformed. Also, uh, Mr. De Hoyas was a world-class art collector. He had paintings on the walls by Diego Rivera, Frida Kahlo, you can see these things in, um, uh, the museums and in catalogs. He had the famous Frida, Frida Kahlo picture, I think it's called the, the Dream. It's a four poster with a skeleton and above it is floating another body. You can, you can find that picture. The, uh, I, where's the picture of the nude on the postcard? I, I gave it to you, didn't I? Yes. Um, he had a I didn't know you wanted a flashback. <laughs> this painting is amazing because it has a story also about in Mexico City, the International Chamber of Commerce. This painting was there when delegates came in. It was somebody's girlfriend. I don't know, but I know that Debbie DeHoyas has it now in her house in Chicago. And uh, it was it's just incredible. Also, there used to be at the museum in Hurleyville a permanent exhibit um, regarding Simplor. So I would imagine, they had a whole room devoted to it. I would it's imagine, not, I no. volunteer there, it's not there now. Well, I know it's not there now, but I would think they still have a lot of the artifacts that oh, they, they have. Oh, yeah, some of these are from there. And, and physically, they have actually also, you know, I don't know, tanks and who knows, but in any event, it was a pretty interesting place. What year did they leave myself? They left Monticello in 93. Not, they were here till 93? Yes. Wow. So it was under, because you would walk by and it said Simplor Division oh, of Nestle. Yes. So. But then they left, and then it was sold in 83 to Bell Flavors and Fragrances. Nestle kind of expanded a little bit beyond, uh, you know, their, their means or whatever. And so they got rid of the flavor and fragrances. You mentioned, um, Louis de Hoyas' art collection. I volunteer at the museum and I got a request to do research on him from Colgate University. That's where he graduated from. Yes. And they wanted any kind of information that we had because they were Jeff. paying a tribute to him. He, he donated a yes. lot of his 
He did. And the gallery at the college is the De Hoyos Gallery also. I will pass this around. This is an incredible painting. It was life size. I mean, it was huge. Where was it in the building? In his office, in Mr. De Hoyos' office, along with, he was also a um, great fisherman. I was just going to say, he, he sort of developed Cozumel. I think he was probably the first person <laughs> that went down there. Uh, before it was turned into quite a tourist yeah. area, it is. And uh, so he would go into this office, amidst the artwork, there were giant fish on the wall. There were swordfish, I don't know, everything was on a big scale. When did he die? He died in 79 or something. He died pretty Junior. young. Junior, yeah. yes, Junior. Yes, Junior. Neither his father nor him were very old. No, actually, he, he might have died in the 80s. I, I don't think he was even 64, but um, he was also went to school here. He, he also, he probably still holds two world records for uh, fishing, solar fly fishing. He had his own fishing tournaments, yep. right? Because he would all, was always uh, shipping fishing poles to Cozumel. Uh, <laughs> and so the people in the shipping department, you know, they had quite a big job to pack up. Among other things, they packed up what they called his rocks, which was a collection of pre-Columbian art, which went all over the world. And he, yeah, he did leave a lot of things to Colgate University when he died. So, but yeah, he was a world-class fisherman. <laughs> he had the first fishing boat on Cozumel before there was even a hotel there. Yeah. He, uh, he built a house there. On Lakewood Avenue. Across the street? From no, the actually they lived on the corner, right, the corner of um, Lake Street, original. The corner of Lake Street on the same side as the factory. Did it have still there? Yeah, yeah. Bob yeah. Norris lived in it. Actually, they lived in the, the, yeah, they, they lived in an apartment at that 28 Oakley. Because I lived, in, my family lived in the front. He lived in the back <coughs> when he first got married. Then mm -hmm. they moved to you know the house on the corner. There was a whole compound of buildings there, and also Sid Austin was very involved with the Southern County Dread workshop, and they had plays in the building. They, they modified it to be a stage. So when you go in, you go up three. What time is it? This is, this is, this is. is that Nan and Sid Austin? Yeah, they live Nan and Sid Austin, yes. They live directly across yeah. the street. The big building she's talking about. Yeah. Another thing was, since the family came here in 1904, Apparently, they never threw anything away. There were many attics in that house. Those houses are sprawled. There was a dog trot between the factory and the house next door where the, um, the matriarch lived. And at that time, if you worked in an office, there was no talking. And I guess she was quite the disciplinarian. So among other things, these attics, there were attics in at least two sections of the building, one over the barn, and every time anybody, uh, to go up into the attic was, you know, a step into history because, and that's what everybody liked to do, to go up there and check out things. They had the most amazing uh, items up there. Yes, um, Mrs. Von Isakovitz, I remember my father never referred to her by Mrs. Von Isakovitz or Mary. Mm -hmm. It was always the Mrs. That's how she was referred to. She lived till 1960 or 61. 61. So she was around, wow. As a witness to history, she was there for so much. Yeah, it was a pretty incredible place. They developed Johnson & Johnson's baby powder. I have a document. I think it's a copy of the original order. And it was 1919, I believe. And if you remember Johnson & Johnson's baby powder at all, one of the old uh, packaging things was it was a can. And it had a trim of gold and orange little checks going down the side. Anyway, so it's remarkable that that came out of Monticello, isn't it? I mean, and they still make it. Was there a big difference in working under the senior and the junior? Well, I didn't work for the senior. Oh. And uh, the junior, when I got there, he was there. But um, he had handed pretty much everything over to Nestle at that point. And they sent out people from White Plains. And they were um, also fascinating. Yeah, did Junior go to Monson High School? Yes. Yeah. He was mayor. They were both mayor. Yeah, they were both yeah, they were both, both, both very civic minded. Uh, Fred Mapledorm was, I don't know how many times he was the, worked for Sid Floor and he was the fire chief. You know, uh, 
because it was right in the village and you know, things like this. Uh, they, you know. Did they, did they have any remnants in Monticello that any of this art or anything, anything around? Or nothing? I don't think there's well, any the art. Well, the De Hoyas Gallery, that's, that's the De Hoyas Gallery at the college. Oh, we have a, yeah, that, that's the name, but the other thing was that they had portraits, um, and there's a pamphlet, they had portraits of the members, the founding members of the family, um, one buddy, remember buddy mm -hmm. was the son of the, of Von Zakovich. He didn't he, 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 he died very, very young, he was, and um, his early 40s. I have his desk in my house. Oh, wow. Is it a roll top? It's oh. not a roll top, it's oak, and then the top just. Okay. Goes. And that was yeah. given to your father by? Yeah, my, when he died, he told someone that he wanted my father to have. I still have it. I have it in my house. Now. My brother's got one of the roll top desks. Yeah, I know. And, you know that's my father. Right? That was it. It's a they were massive and they were yeah. just so filled with, you know, well, they never got Evan, you want to say anything? No, just that my father did work there also. He was not chemist or anything. I can't tell you when he started. I was born in 51 and, um, he got out around 68, 67, somewhere in that time. So during that time frame, yes, I, I went there a lot because my father had a second job, which was a home soda delivery man. And I would meet him so we could go out on deliveries after school. I'd go from the middle school of Walk Bedford, dad would be done and off we'd go to his second job. But I remember a specific thing that came to the house. We used it often. We called it pink cream. Yes. Yep. And it was the yeah. best burn cream, and I wish I still had it. <laughs> I, I think we threw it out with mom died too, but I still would like a tin of that. It was pink in color. I don't, it, it almost, uh, what, maybe like, I can't even describe how it felt, but I know if you got a burn and you put that on, it, he, he, the, the sting went away. It was a there sad. Was, it was some kind of sad, mm -hmm. but we always, I don't know if it had a technical name, but we just called it the burn cream, and there was a can like like uh, you would get bag bombing today, a uh, square can, and we always had it candy for burns, but yes, my, <coughs> the smell, yes, my father reeked of it. What was your father's name? Uh, Richard Edwards. Okay, and yours? Mine, Evelyn Edwards Vandermark. Thank you. So, um, yes, and, but really the smells that I remember as a kid walking there, some were just good. I didn't think they were bad. You know, they changed over time. Some days smelt one way. And when I lived on Roosevelt Place, down by the Maple Barns and everything, I'd smell it there. I mean, there was a certain distance, you'd always smell that smell. Um, but Dad reeked of it, and it seemed like it never left him, right? You know, because he'd take the clothes to the next shop because he never changed, he just wore the same thing. So I always, I can even today smell my father and those <laughs> scents that were always with him. <laughs> That's all. You said about the, the cream. They didn't sell, if I'm not mistaken, Retail products. No, 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 but dad working there somehow they got it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. brought it home and, and, and the guy had that the best also. thing. Like everybody had yeah, it. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, little bottles of stuff would come home, and you know, us girls, my sister and I would get the oh. perfume type of thing. Judy has some, some perfumes here oh, yeah. that sit uh, for, they made things, you know, Christmas vines and stuff, little things little like box, that. Little and, gift yeah. boxes like this, I think probably this yeah. was given to my mother. Um, I got it. it does say um, <laughs> it, it says sin floor but it has a bell on it as well so I think it was a later a later, later model of perfume and I'm not an uh, expert on perfume but it kind of smells like Chanel number no. Somewhere in my mind, I had like Lily of the Valley or something oh, yeah, yeah. in my head. But that was the, yeah. That's the two. The pink cream and the Lily of the Valley was something that I really relate to. But the farm markets were, were, were big. A lot of people didn't realize, you know, how big it was. I mean, Judy could tell you where her father shipped out and 
55 gallon drums and they're you know selling it you can see by the pound you know, so if, you know you start multiplying it out and they had a, a they really had a, a clientele of people that wouldn't go anywhere else but to buy what they wanted at Simplor. I mean they had such a reputation like her father would, would you know I remember the, the UPS guys or the, the shippers would come in and stand there waiting because everything was going through these big filters. And they said, can't you run through water and through there? And the guy would tell them, water is slower. <laughs> that would have been just the... You see the just, uh, going in, the, you know, the, the stuff going up the tubes mm -hmm. and down the tubes. Yeah. But my father worked at the same, or same yeah. time as... Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. They were friends. I would yes. think your father was... I don't know how long, in fact, with Reg being dead and Richard being dead, I, I have not done well. Only Dan is Dan says, well, I'm not the oldest, so I don't remember. But <laughs> and I'm being the youngest, it just doesn't, I couldn't get any more information. But I think so. your father would have been called an assistant chemist as well, right? Oh, he never bragged about being a chemist, that's for sure. They, were they, were going, you know, they had no degrees or anything. No, I mean, really, my father never graduated high school. Yeah. He had polio and... Uh, was never really, you know, could do much of anything. Uh, you know, the people that uh, mixed the uh, fragrance, they were called compounders. Mm -hmm. And they worked off of formulas. And uh, I have a book of formulas. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Don't, Don't tell Bill. And, <laughs> and the scales. <laughs> How about the scales, the old fashioned scales, yes. where you put the weight on? Yeah. Uh, those are uh, they, they were brass and they were beautiful in and of themselves. So. Did, it, did, it, did they pay pretty decently to work there? No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> no. In a word, no. <laughs> Except when Nestle came. The Nestle they came. The Westchester um, they yeah. averages. Yeah, they still. Yeah, growing up, I would say my father, my mother just kind of lived. Yeah, but that was pretty, you know, we're talking about the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Pretty normal. There were so many jobs, you weren't making that much more than subsistence, mm -hmm. unless owned, owned it or was a professional. I do. But people did stay for decades. Yes. Maybe there wasn't a lot of other choices, you know. I remember the De Hoyas, though, used to buy my father's stock, different forms of stock, and just I mean, it wasn't hundreds and thousands of No, but well, well, Luke Jr. was on the board of what was Sullivan County Trust, and it was County Trust. Uh, now it's the Chase Bank up there. Mm -hmm. And he would, he would, like Judy said, give out you know, for Christmas and bonuses or something like that, a few couple of shares of stock. Well, and it's, 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 you know, it, it's... Uh, Melon Bank now. Say, sorry, I still have a few shares. That's how it's, <laughs> it's uh, Bank of New York Melon. I think they were good to their employees. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, I, even though we were kids, I could see that, you know, they, they were. I remember going to a pork roast that Juan Glassini had at his house. And I know I was a little girl and uh, watching this big pork go around the circle. I'm like, oh, look. My mother with the five of us going, you know, she was hysterical. So that wasn't her thing. But we got through it. But yes, one, they were very, you know, invited the family for a pork roast. And well, I didn't Juan know Glassini. what we were into watching this big pork turn around. Juan <laughs> Glassini used to travel to Mexico a lot. And every time he did, he would come back and when she wasn't even working there anymore. Good David, oh, sorry, David, go ahead. Okay. I would think that people lived in nearby homes that had to smell these fragrances 24 hours a day. There would be health consequences for that. Well, I often wonder because of the young age that the De Hoyas has died and Aloyas von Isakovitz Jr. is only in his early 40s. I don't know if the smell that Odors or whatever had anything to do with it. I don't know. But, but, but then the missus lived. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> but you know, reading in the papers when I came in the 60s, there weren't a lot of articles about the smell. Somewhere in the 70s, when I think they expanded or changed the operation, that's when, at least in the newspapers, a lot of complaints that they had the, oh, I remember the sign, the odor hotline mm -hmm. was within a couple of blocks. 
of the plan so people just saw if they had a problem. I would think it's in April. Uh, no, with the slide, you're right. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, did they have any interaction with the hotels at all? Or is there any kind of? Not no. really. No. No. Okay. Well, what's interesting though, we talk about hotels, Arthur Winner, the founder of the Concord, you know, he got his start in the 20s in Manhattan as a barber, but then he developed Jerry's hair time. time. And his grandson, years ago, Jimmy said, he was talking about it, he said, you know, and that had the aroma. He was a perfumist uh, as well, and that was maybe, you know, a lot of barbers developed their own tonics in those days, but not that many became national. So it could have been the essence of the perfume that helped Jarrett become a, a national product. And I, I mentioned earlier about uh, Lou DeHoy Sr.'s wife and her family from Virginia. At one time, when I was still in grade school, well, that's a long time ago, uh, she had a flag. <laughs> we, we graduated together, that's how it is. Uh, she had a flag that went back to the Revolutionary War from their family in Virginia. And she, I was allowed, she let me take it to school for like a show and tell at one time. They only had four or five flags on it because that's how many states there were at the time. I mean, it just went back. And I, I remember this flag, and then when her house got cleaned out, when, when Deborah DeHoyce cleaned out uh, her grandmother's house, I asked her, I said, did you run across this flag? And never did. Never, never did. Uh, I, I don't know what happened to it, but this is how far back the family goes. I could show you some of the articles, uh, you know, going back into, you know, no. The fur family that came over in the 1600s, and you know. No, um, I think it was Louis de Hoyas Jr.'s wife was a Kenny, Kenny, mm -hmm. and the Kennys owned the old homestead mm -hmm. with the old homestead restaurant. Marion was her name. Marion. 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 In fact, I have a postcard. It's on. If you look at a town of Thompson. Uh, website, there's a thing with a whole bunch of old postcards and everything else, and it shows the Hotel Kinney. That's, you know, later became mm -hmm. the homestead. So. That was a hotel or a boarding or a, a transit place since the mid-1800s, because that was on the route of the New Newburgh to Shecton Turnpike. So that's where, you know, and there was a lot of places to stay along that route. It was a long trip in those days from the Delaware to the Hudson. It was a stagecoach stop. Mm -hmm. stage yeah. stop. And it was a post office also. They used to bring, we used to have the boxes downstairs. You oh, know, really? the mail boxes downstairs oh, in the basement. Oh, the bridge rules. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so much information. There's so much more. And I spoke to three people just today that couldn't make it. That I think we're, we're going to have a follow-up in better weather. And there's so much information that people have that isn't here. So I think we'll have a project of the library here and if not a book, certainly a CD, you know, so we could record things and record the, the stories that people tell, as well as some of the documents. Because otherwise here we're gone, but, so look for the spring. To, you know, we're not finished yet. You know, look for stuff and we'll try to, and even in the meantime, if you could make copies of things, or maybe we'll try to make announcements to come here to make copies, and even some oral. I'll bring, I'll bring my book of formulas and we can whip something up. <laughs> 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 now you, you talk about mix, mixing it. My father's one office was upstairs. That was basically his lab. And I have pictures with him, you know, sitting in his office with just hundreds and hundreds of different small bottles of fragrances. And he would dip in these little skinny, like, litmus papers and put them in, I'd take five or six of them, and he'd go outside and put them in a, in a clothespin and smell them and just, you know, try to tell what each one was and how you had to put them together. Like she said, her father could tell what was in, you know, something that he was, you know, making and, and you know, putting together. And this was, this was a, you know, a business of raiding the other companies. You know, you, know, you have a product that's so great, well, we want to see if we can duplicate it. 
You know, that's... Uh, you know, I do have a question. I was wondering if how SIN4 might have been connected to Colmar Laboratories in Port Jervis. Do you no. know any connection? No, no, no connection. No. Okay. They, so they, 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 they occasionally they contacted them. each other for, you yeah. know, something, but, you know. Colmar uh, uh, they they make yeah. up yeah. and they'll yeah. yeah. oh, okay. Mostly yeah. make up. And they still do. It's still down in the river. It is along the yeah, river. That's it used they, to be up on the mountain. Yeah. You know, well, that, that was the problem. They put places with effluents literally on the river. And for years, factories and so forth threw their waste into the river, which became an issue. But they, they, they've been trying to detoxify the Hudson for, yeah. from GM for 20 years, spending billions. G. So people that have stuff or know other people will try to have it in better weather. But also, a Sandra Coden taught chemistry at, at Southern Community College, and I was. We might be able to get in and if there are any bottles that we yeah. can use to bring in if we can get up there. Because there's still remnants. There's still stuff there. We're not exactly sure.
here's some here's a product that had virtually nothing to do with it and was here for what over 100 years and uh, so uh, you know 89 years. the business that grew quick way metal they started making pools uh, the postcard companies were indigenous but this was type it came from space. Yeah, yes. And I still don't know. I find it interesting. I don't know. Just what really brought to Monticello to Chihuahua? And was it some connection? And how did the horse was, was help? What? Well, was he came for help. Right. Yeah, Dennis Lockridge came for health reasons. No, no. Yeah. But a lot of people went to live there. Yeah. Something was it. And then how did him and Louis de Hoyo Sr. hook up? I have it here in one of the stories. Oh, okay. I have to so research it. Yeah. It's, oh. you know, a lot of it's here because I have, uh, uh, Janet gave it to me. One's on the 75th anniversary of Syncord. The other's on the 100th anniversary. And Judy has the one here, too, that tells quite a bit. Uh, and each one goes a little bit further than, than the other. So we have several different uh, histories of, 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 of Mr. Van Osakovich and, uh, you know, his education in Austria and how he, you know, how he came here and then after being here a few years, ended up in Monticello to get cleaner air and, you know, be a little more pure. In fact, it's the fact that, I don't know, it was Janet that gave me a, a card who had Mr. Van Arsakovich's name on it from the 1800s, late 1800s, that belonged to a bicycle club that was in Monticello. Oh, must have wow. rode a bicycle. So, yeah. Who showed you that? And I, somebody gave it to me, and I gave it to, to Debbie DeHoyce. I said, here, that, you know, yeah, oh, you oh. Keep, keep this yourself. And, uh, but I'm trying to think where, who gave it to me, and I, you know, I, I gave it to her. I figured, you know. Do you remember the wine collection? Louis' wine collection? Oh, he had some wine collection. It was in the hallway. Oh, well, yeah, it was everywhere. It was, <laughs> yeah. he, was, he, was, he was also a wine collection. And he had big, uh, the big wooden scoops, the shovels. Oh, it was like going into a museum in his office. They were all labeled with where they came from in the year and the history. I mean, it was everywhere there. Yeah. Yeah. So who's going to write the book? Well, Byron's going to write the book. What are you going to compile data? And, you know, and we will at least put it on CD and to have you. Uh, the video portion as much, you know, and the interviews and the pictures and the documents, like all, everything that I have today now on the um, PowerPoint, that's all digitized already. So it wasn't such a big deal. So, but now the items themselves, that's different, we'll just try to take good pictures of it. And we, I mean, this place could be the focus, people could come in at times to make to take good photos of the items that we can't give you know and uh, we'll go explore more at the headquarters on you know if any confusion it was Oakley Avenue now it's all Lakewood Avenue uh -huh. so if you see addresses late uh, any Oakley changed to uh, but just one more thing about they started in 1889 in 1906. The Pure Food and Drug and Cosmetic Law, big laws took effect to, that were going to challenge the things that people were saying. Would, they didn't have to differentiate um, genuine from synthetic. People were just saying um, lemon plate, lemon, but maybe it wasn't real lemon. So how they fought back, or it was brought up that the proprietor when he came here, most important chemicals, or many, for flavorings and uh, fragrances were imported. But he said his idea, Sinfluor, we could do this synthetically. And then when the labeling came, became required, I'll just read for what he said. Say you have vanilla, vanilla was big. So he said, that the artificial, when you have real vanilla beans, you have, well, well, let me just read it. Um, uh, the, uh, the proprietor, chief chemist and founder, was one of the earliest American uh, enthusiasts for synthetic aromatic chemical companies. He claimed that the law, that law I just 
had actually increased the sales of his products. Previously, the chemist did not get credit for the work he did. So chemists were always born around with natural products. Because many, a, ma a manufacturer made a synthetic flavor and they labeled it genuine, but they couldn't do that anymore. But when in reality it was made from synthetic substances entirely, but they don't want to say, they, they just said natural. Today, this is what he wrote in 1908, the product is labeled truthfully and sells just as well, proving that the public will buy a product just as quickly when properly labeled. His advocacy for the virtues of synthetic flavorings can be seen in the adver advertisement for vanilla. And then he said the ad copy read, but it was called vanilla dure. The only quote, the only material in existence that will duplicate in its entirety the fragrance of the finest vanilla bean. In fact, he said, something better than vanilla beans, an imitation under the pure food law, they were, they were required to include this. It developed a much finer, more intense vanilla effects than the finest beans owing to the absence of impurities and resinous matter. So he's saying his stuff, like you were describing before, how it's pure and filtered and all that, but when you get natural beans, there could be all kinds of impurities and resins, whatever it are. So his point, of course, that was his business, right. is that this stuff, the synthetic, is pure. Well, it's cheaper. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. And then America didn't have to. One of the differences, though, is that when you get the natural product, there are often minute amounts of other compounds involved that create the essence of the natural. Oh, when you oh. synthesize it in the laboratory, you're making one chemical. Right, right. And it's, it is what it is, and the odor would be familiar, but it may not have the subtleties of the natural because it doesn't have the minute amounts of the other chemicals, right, which are in small enough amounts that it doesn't matter, but when you get it all together, it gives you a different thing. Right, something so more that, real. That's he what, didn't that's say that, what but the natural you. product does that the synthetic doesn't. When you synthesize the chemical, it's one particular compound that you are making, and it doesn't have anything else in it. Got it. So what he's saying is impurities, <laughs> Some of that could have actually enhanced the flavor. And many, many times it does, which is why in real perfumery they still use the natural essences from the plants and the higher level, the real expensive perfumes. At least they're supposed to. Supposed to be natural. Okay, thank you. Uh, That's not the same thing uh, with the flavorings. When they exactly, used artificial yes. flavorings. Yes. I saw it in Mexico when I was, you know, getting in. Was, was down there and they took real strawberries, real cherries, whatever flavor they were making, and they mixed it in with the artificial flavoring to, you know, right. to you know, I mean, there reduce is one the, compound that will have uh, the main essence, uh -huh. like banana oil or coconut or any of those, but when you get it from the plant, there's other things in there, and even the, like you said, a strawberry flavor from a strawberry is not the same as strawberry soda, because that's the one compound. Anyone else have anything to say? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So thank you all. And um, so we'll look